Professional Louise, how are you keeping? Not too bad. Morning, lads. Uh, we might stick with the Olympics for a minute or two, though, Louise. You were at the Women's Sevens for the duration of the competition, I think. And what a competition it was. It was absolutely unbelievable. Yeah, I was there from um, Sunday morning till yesterday. Um, so, brilliant competition. Um, I have to say the French did a phenomenal job at the Sevens anyway. I didn't have tickets or anything else, but we did walk around the city and it seems to be going pretty well over there. Um, in terms of the Sevens itself, I suppose, obviously, the men's and women's are split up. Um, and the men, the Frenchmen, obviously won a gold medal. So the support was phenomenal that we could see from the screens. But in fairness, <laughs> they didn't um, step away or stop coming once the French ladies were knocked out of quarterfinal in terms of medal hopes. There were still between 66 and 70,000 people in the stadium. Um, and the atmosphere was incredible. It's probably, it's definitely the best atmosphere I've ever experienced at any women's sporting event. Um, so yeah, really well done, really well supported and really enjoyed the few days. I think it was a brilliant advertisement for the Olympics, for France itself, and definitely for women's rugby sevens. What was the most dramatic thing you saw? Like that Australia-USA game was absolutely insane. Oh, yeah, definitely. And <laughs> that is sevens. You have to play until the final second. I think just a little bit earlier to that, in kind of a seventh, eighth playoff, um, or fifth, sixth playoff, I should say, GB, uh, had the game five minutes in their line and there is you can either go into touch um and kick the ball to touch but they actually pass the ball to touch they were up and trying to end up getting a penalty clock was in the red end up scoring so i thought that was going to be the only kind of real after the buzzer um match winner but then yeah like australia just obviously just gotten a try and opted to go deep instead of going contestable their kickoff even though uh, they've, they've quite a competitive kick, kickoff and they just didn't front up defensively two missed tackles and he was there under the post and then I don't know if you were watching going but you've 30 seconds to take conversion and I mean it was it was a gimme but at the same time they were celebrating so much that they ended up taking the conversion with eight seconds to go they were nearly shouting at them going ah take conversion or else you're going to a to extra time um, so yeah, that was pretty incredible. But it was actually really good for the game because I think Australia would have been they would have been relieved to have gotten the bronze because they were going for gold 100. percent Whereas you say were delighted to get a bronze. So it was kind of um, you know they they had different agendas coming into that third four place playoff. It's very hard if you're like this is sevens you you lose the semi final like Australia did. And a few hours later, they have to make sure they consolidate at least bronze, and they actually didn't manage to do that. And now having been kind of the golden girls all season and, um, you know, Rio, they obviously got got gold. They ended up coming sixth, I think, in Tokyo in the end and fourth in France. So it, they won't be, definitely won't be happy with that. It, it does feel that there were a couple of really high moments from Ireland's perspective in both the men's and women's sevens competition. But the results are probably going to be something that disappoints both teams, I suspect. Yeah, I think, look, the men's, they... Were I mean, anyone in those top six teams really could have meddled. Um, and the men, know oh, they were so close. They were so close against Fiji, who were so close to winning the gold overall. Um, and even you could say if they'd beaten New Zealand again, they were very much controlling their group game. They would avoid a Fiji, but you can only beat what's put up in front of you. Um, yeah, so look, they'll be disappointed they didn't get a medal. But I think coming off the back of Tokyo, where, again, they, they qualified late, maybe a month or so before the competition, um, and then they kind of really didn't perform in that that tournament. It might show that you nearly need to play in one to get over the hype of it being an Olympics. And it's, it is still very different to just a regular World Series 7th competition. Um, and for the girls as well, like, you know, like I know we've seen Lucy Mulhall, the captain, who's just a tremendous player, um, and like the heartbeat of women's sevens in Ireland. She's she's stepped away now, but she actually came into the competition carrying an injury since March. Never really kind of got going. Um, and yeah, they they were actually a bit flat at the start against GB. I think that would be their most disappointing game. Will actually nearly be the first game because that's where you you set your stall out. Good win against South Africa. Actually, a very good performance. Their final group game against Australia. I think it was nineteen twelve. The end it was a really good game. I don't think it was shown over here. Um, they really played, put in a really good performance. Then end up playing them in the quarter final again and just end up um, getting well beaten, which is which is disappointing. So. Yeah, it was not the end they would have hoped for, but at the end of the day, um, 
their Olympians. They've put Irish rugby sevens, I think, on the map. Um, they took part in a fantastic tournament. And I think it's that's the barometer now is to make sure you qualify for every Olympics and progress on from there. Yeah, for sure. Right, we should uh, look ahead to the All-Ireland football final this Sunday. Kerry versus Galway is the senior final at a quarter past four. Uh, it's the first ever meeting between the sides in an All-Ireland final. I'm just interested, first of all, in your perspective on Galway, Louise. We, we will obviously come to, to Kerry in just a moment, but uh, there's a slew of recent enough games against them. You would have played against them in last year's National League final. And I think maybe the last time Kerry lost to them was, was 2021, which I presume you would have been playing in as well. So good recent record from Kerry's perspective against Galway, but Galway did cause him problems uh, throughout all of those games and obviously getting that win in, in 2021. Yeah, um, I suppose in terms of head-to-head battles, they're definitely a team Kerry would always have respected because they've always had brilliant footballers, a lot of pace. Um, but they, at times, they, I don't know, it seemed like they didn't always kind of have it together. I think for them last year, that league final, which was um, the most recent, I suppose, big meeting or you know the only probably Cork Park meeting that I would have played them in, I don't think they performed that day. We, we I think we performed very well, but I don't think that was best of Galway either so I don't think that was probably a fair kind of reflection of the two teams um, I think they're coming into this like both teams are coming in with a very different kind of record or almost um, I don't want to say agenda they're both coming in the same agenda which is to win but if you look at the start of this year Galway lost seven of their first nine games now a lot of those were less than two points in terms of you know league games um, and up until they got to kind of the Connacht final which they, they won in Mayo and that seemed to kind of kickstart their season a bit now they still lost the first first um, All-Ireland qualifier game against Cork but since then they went on a they've been on a three game winning streak um, and they've all been big games so you know they've kind of come into this going. If in April they realised they were going to be in an All Ireland final, this is a huge success for them. Mm-hmm. At the same time, they are sixty minutes away from winning Brendan Martin, and they're not going to just turn up on the day to make up the numbers. Um, but I think at the start of the season, I'm not sure how many of them truly would have believed they were in an All Ireland final. Um, they might have said it, but you know, deep down, kind of yourself. Um, whereas I think Kerry are kind of coming into it from a different angle. It's very much a case of unfinished business. It has been the only goal since, you know, fair enough, do well in the league. Monster Championship is definitely something that's been important um, and because we haven't won it over the previous years, but it hasn't been the end goal. The end goal has been the 4th of August. That date has been etched in the minds of all the Kerry players, all the Kerry management since it's been announced or since the 13th of August last year when we lost. So, um, they're both coming at it from different viewpoints, which is or from kind of different kind of journeys. Um, but at the same time, 60 minutes in Galway have almost snatched an All-Ireland off, you know, the likes of everyone else. But they're certainly there in merit. You can't argue that. They've beaten the All-Ireland champions. They've beaten Cork, who they'd lost to twice already this year in the semi-final. So um, they haven't had any particular easy route. They're there on merit. Yeah, that path is a, a very interesting one. That game against God, or the game against Dublin, was absolutely insane because I'm not sure is it because it's Dublin or was it because of the way the game went but certainly in that second half when Dublin get their noses in front you think well this is done you know th- this is how it always goes from from Dublin's perspective but Galway didn't read that script and for the game to go to extra time or for them to win the game in the way that they did definitely shows I don't know just uh, a, a disrespect for any sort of preconceived notions about who should be beating who in this championship uh, a ballsiness mm-hmm. that obviously they're going to bring to proceedings at the weekend and they're a bit of a dangerous animal, to say the very least, Louise. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think they've, like, in ways they, they're missing, some, I don't want to say missing some players, but there are players that would have been playing for them that are, you know, way in America, that would have been perceived starters in the past. Um, but what they have, they just seem to be very united. Um, Daniel Moynihan's really created um, a strong defensive system. Uh, what's crucial to them is getting goals. I think I've read that they got 12 goals in the last um, three or four games. So that is really, you know, gives them massive oxygen. And I think that would be a huge um, goal of Kerry's is to avoid them getting goals the last takes again against Corks, two, seven to 10 points. It's it's those two goals just before half time that really, um, you know, they, they, they're able to set up defensively then and almost protect that lead to a certain point while continuing to tip on scores. They have an excellent free taker in um, in Roisin Leonard. So if they start to get their noses ahead and she 
gets a free within any radar. She's able to tip them over, which keeps the scoreboard taken over. Um, obviously, excellent penalty taker as well. And I think she's someone who's very important because she, over the years, has um, carried a few injuries, but she's you know certainly back on form this year and really spearheading their attack. Giving up goal chances, though, is not something that Kerry have done too much of, certainly in that our map performance, they were very stingy at the back. And, uh, I mean, obviously, our map potentially didn't have their shooting boots on in that first half in particular of that game. But it seems that Kerry's defensive system when it comes to conceding goals is well set. Yeah, in fairness, it is something that um, they would focus a lot on and that kind of, you know, team defence ethos, like it's it's something that has been, hasn't changed a whole lot over the last few seasons. It's been fine-tuned, um, but there's a huge amount of work rate amongst the whole Kerry team. It doesn't matter what numbers are on your back to make sure that any goal chance like that is is snuffed out um, and a lot, a lot of work done with the, the goalkeepers as well. But it's all Ireland final day. We have coughed up goals over the last last two All Ireland finals. Um, so that it's definitely something that I, I think if Kerry would believe that if they can stop Galway scoring goals, they would be miserly enough in defence, particularly if they keep their discipline to not give Roisin Leonard too many frees. I don't think Galway are going to score a massive amount from play. Like even in the out of that two seven against Cork, I think one two is from play. Um, so the key is no goals, no frees within kickable distance for Roisin Leonard. Um, I think if Kerry can focus on those two things defensively, then they'll be they'll manage to um, snuff them out from play um, and, and not uh, not let them outscore them. But at the same time, Kerry would be very disappointed with their own, um, I suppose. Uh, their accuracy, particularly in the second half of that game against Armagh. Um, when you're there watching it live, obviously Armagh got into a four point to one point lead, even though Kerry had the wind, which was a little bit unsettling. Um, but again, kind of a sign of a bit of an experienced team. There was no real panic. Um, got themselves back in the game, scored a very good goal themselves, playing real direct football. And uh, from there on, particularly in the second half, we managed the game very well. But at the same time, we didn't put it to bed and that will definitely be huge work on. Um, I think we controlled our possession defensively. Like, I don't think Kenny Mallon was, you know, she, she was probably carrying a knock coming into the game and obviously they're missing um, Amy Mack and our map. Like, out defensively, we really shut them down. But we really struggled to put away chances that we created. There were good chances. Um, so that would have been a huge work on for the last two weeks for, for Declan and Dara. You've touched on the recent history uh, of Kerry, which I do want to come back to in just a moment. But I, I do wonder, Louise, when it comes to um, a longer period of history and Kerry football, the 31 years without an All-Ireland thing is definitely one of the, the most extraordinary statistics, I think, in, in Gaelic games right now that it has gone that long for, for a Kerry football team to not win an All-Ireland. You've obviously uh, seen the team at... Uh, at a level before it was contending for all Ireland's in the last five to ten years or so, like, can you just speak about how much things have come on in Kerry with regards to, to, to mm -hmm. the changing of things, to, to the changing of of situations here, where um, where it has been possible for for Kerry to become uh, all Ireland contenders? Because if if you go back down through the years, when you look at say even the, the early stages of of Dublin winning consecutive all Ireland's and Cork before that. Kerry weren't really in the picture, but it does feel that at least they've placed themselves into that picture right now. Yeah, definitely. And the knock-on effect of that own is that... Um, sorry, I have a two... Take your time, Louise. Me. All good. He's, he's uh, not too happy with his <laughs> choice on YouTube Kids at the moment. Um, so, yeah, I think the knock-on effect is the, the, the amount of kids and young girls um, that you can see now playing ladies football here in Kerry and like the turnout both the trainings at the you know the amount of clubs that have sprouted up and fielding even a second team um and even then uh like the amount of girls coming to like open sessions it's been, definitely been a huge knock-on effect but yeah things have changed over the years I suppose definitely the early part of my career Cork would have been the main dominant force um and there was definitely probably a lack of belief there but also even a lack of just depth, commitment. Oh, I don't want to say commitment. There was there was definitely commitment, but I think if you don't believe you're going to beat these teams, sometimes that can be just you're mentally beaten before you take to the field. Right. Um, but as well as that, there's definitely been a lot more investment. Uh, and not that it is all about investment, but you know, standards have improved certainly down in Kerry. And then the players' commitment to like this team at the moment, 
they could not give anymore. Um, they, there's no, you know, there's there's people missing weddings, whatever it is, left, right, and centre because they just have training. That's that's the standard we're at now. Um, the management team there that have they've been really good advocates for the players to get whatever they need to be able to perform, to be able to train. And look, there'll always be little bits that aren't there that you could compare to another team or the easy comparison, which maybe isn't always the fairest, is the men's. But at the same time, I think it's improving a small bit year and year. Um, access to things like, you know, proper strength conditioning, nutrition, and nutrition, your, um, your psychological support, that all those little bits come together to allow the players to perform on the field. Um, so it's it's certainly not a turnaround in one year. I think it's been something that's been building year year and year, and it's the right people and the right jobs that are um, creating that. And then when you create a real positive environment, you have players that want to stay on playing. I mean, if Louise Never Hurtigs is something like her seventeenth season for Kerry, Lorraine Scanlon's probably at about fifteen, something like that. They wouldn't be still there if they weren't enjoying it. If they weren't seeing it improve year and year. Um, and again, I think in all Ireland it would really be a massive, as was Terry on top, to try and solidify that and kind of ensure against what's going to happen in the future. Because then, you know, you have hopefully Brendan Martin come to Kerry next week and you're praying him around the county and you're bringing him to all the clubs and you're inspiring the next generation and you're trying to keep more girls playing in the game and let them dream of playing for Kerry one day in all Ireland final day. And likewise, if that happens to Galway, I hope they do the exact same because yeah. that's what you need to try and bring the competitors up to the likes of the in most recent times, the Dublin, the Meath, the Cork. Um, I think it's really good for the game, just like the men's the weekend, to have um, to have like our man Galway in the final, to have Kerry and Galway. It's going to be a new champion. I know Galway won in 2004, but it's, it's going to be a relatively new winner, which... It's definitely a positive for the game. It's a line that we always use in the show that uh, deserves got nothing to do with it, but all mm. the same, how much does yeah. Louise Nemira Hertig deserve this moment at the weekend if she were to get over the line? Well, I'll tell you, she'd swap every single individual award she's ever gotten to, to have done it. Um, I, I do think Louise would be the first person to point to the, the team around her, but I suppose huge commitment over the years um, and has never stepped away. I, I actually asked her recently, has she ever like missed a game or championship game to go on holidays, ever do a J1 and you know, she never has. It's been literally unwavering commitment. So as I say, deserving means nothing in sport, but I don't think there'd be many players around the country who would be it. I'll, I'll say that much. Yeah, for sure. Which way do you think it's going to go, Louise? I, I do think it's it's... I don't want to say it's carries to lose, but um, I think they're so much further along in their journey. They have gained so much experience from the last two years. Um, and I think there's probably more from play, more threats from play. And I think they have the game management and the maturity. Like, again, if they'd just blown Arma out of the water, you'd be saying, hmm, how tested are they? But again, going down 4-1 in that first half against the wind, the only team that have beaten them twice this year are Arma as well. But they would just seem very mature, very, very settled. I think they look fitter. Like Armagh are a very fast team. They struggled with some of the pacey players just because that's their strength. But actually, the last 10 minutes, the conditioning of the Kerry girls, they were able to maintain it all through the year. I think that's come on in the, than in the previous few seasons. They've built on that. So I think um, I think it is going to be Kerry to win. Um, and I, I'm hoping so as well. I think that's my heart on my head saying that one. But Galway have made um, a habit of taking scalps and they're obviously loving this underdogs tag and they're going to come in all guns blazing. Um, I think we really need to watch Nicola Ward come on from centre-back as well, similar to Lauren McConnell from Armash. She's a brilliant footballer, massive creator for them. Um, but I think if they focus on those few things um, and get enough from play ourselves, then Kerry are going to be winning yeah. Brendan Martin for the first time in 31 years yeah it's uh, it's been an incredible time with that one and insofar as you can try and enjoy Sunday uh, watching your teammates <laughs> out there trying to get over the line uh, Louise Galvin a pleasure as always thanks so much for taking the call cheers guys